I mean, there's really no stress about being on a live stream except thousands of people are watching you play. I mean, if that enough isn't enough stress for you uh, as a recreational player, then I don't know what is. Live streams are tough. When you make a mistake on a live stream, uh, everybody sees it. They don't get to hear your thought process, what was behind the decision. They just get to see the end result and be very results oriented. And so it's in the back of your head. What would you guys do with Ace Keegan? Whoa! Whoa. What? Yeah. So this is a really exciting week. We get to play two different live streams. This is gonna be live stream number two and three for my entire career. So really excited about that. We're playing at uh, Rounders here in San Antonio on Thursday. And then we're heading to Dallas to play at TCH Dallas the following Tuesday. So we got this stream set up for Thursday night, and then we found out that uh, Big Daddy Chaz and Poker Traveler were both gonna be in the game. When I found out Poker Traveler and Chaz were gonna be on the uh, stream, I wanted to strangle Rob um, for setting this up. And just not because they're not good guys, they're very good guys. I like them very much. Um, but when they start to play a 1-3 game, they are not going to take that game as seriously as they were playing a 25-50 game. Both of these guys regularly play 5-10, 10-20, sometimes even 25-50. And so these are not just casual players or action players. These are guys that know this game very, very well and they know how to exploit. Of course, we couldn't have gotten a horse table draw. It comes out, Paul's on my direct left. Poker Traveler's on his direct left. Chaz is on his direct left. Having the two of them directly to my left was, you know, not fun. And then, you know, you had to adjust play to because, you know, you could open up a hand and then Chaz would just jam with three seven. It definitely affected the entire night because both me and Paul had to do a lot of larger array sizes and a lot of three bets over opens to isolate and push them out of pots. It's just one of those things seat position really does matter a lot especially in these types of games um, and i got the worst seat drawer of the night so after the way last week went with paul right out of the gate he's in a hand very quickly with ace king against queens when you're playing 500 dollars um a one three game and you, your max is 500 dollars it doesn't take very long to get a, a, an all-in situation and uh, i'm just sitting here going please win the flip just win a flip I'm sitting next to the guy, so I know if this doesn't go well, it's going to be a long night. So it ended up being it ran out uh, dry. I didn't hit anything and uh, was down 500 in the first five hands of the stream, which is, you know, OK. You feel bad. We're, we're not even 10 minutes into the night and Paul's already stuck a buy in and I've been there. It's not fun, uh, but you just have to suck it up, dig in and go to work. So because these guys play higher stakes, you don't know right out of the gate how they're gonna play, how seriously they're gonna take the game. Are they gonna play really big action or are they going to play straightforward? You're not gonna be able to put them on any hands and you're just gonna to have to go with instinct and the strength of your hand, really, because he could have any two cards. But within the first 20 minutes, it was pretty obvious that Chaz was gonna have some fun and splash some chips on the table and he wasn't looking to play too seriously. And so I got into a situation, I opened ace 10 of diamonds from late position it came to Chaz and he announced that he was going all in for his last $120 after losing a big pot the hand before without looking at his cards. Poker Traveler had flatted between us, so it was a pretty easy decision for me at this point. I'm just jamming and pushing Poker Traveler out of the pot against any two cards. I have a really good uh, range advantage here. We're just going with it. So I snap shove. Poker Traveler folds, and Chaz decides he's not gonna look at his cards until the end. Max Sweat, right? So we're out of the gate, we get a monotone board with a ace of clubs. Uh, turn is a queen brick, so we're still feeling pretty good about our top pair. River is the queen of clubs, which puts four clubs on the board and two queens, and now I lose to any club, I lose to any uh, queen. He flips over the first card with no club, and then he goes to flip over the second card, and no club. So we won a nice little pot there and kind of patted ourselves on the back for uh, being aggressive and being willing to shove there instead of uh, getting scared and just flatting. 
So then after I picked off Chaz, it was Paul's turn to try and pick off Chaz. Of course, I get ace king again. I raise, uh, Chaz just flats. Flop is really, really dry. Three, three, two. That favors Paul's range, especially with how crazy Chaz is playing. Yes, Chaz can have some three X because he's playing any two cards, but his range is still really uncondensed. I check because again, with Chaz, you don't know where he's going to be here. He just played the other hand, three, five. You don't know. Um, he bets. Obviously, I'm going to call one street to see what there is. The so turn's a six. Not the greatest card for Paul's range. I checked. He bet, and I really just figured, I, you know what, I, if I don't make a stand early with something, he's just gonna continue to do this pretty much all night. So I re-raised him, uh, he called. And of course the river's an ace, which is a really good card. And they end up getting it in. I'm just hoping, you know, he's overvaluing his hands or maybe he has jacks or queens or kings or anything of that nature. Um, but of course he turns over a straight and that was the second bullet for the uh, stream. And so then a little bit later in the stream, Paul tries to get revenge on Chaz. Uh, Poker Traveler opens from early position. Uh, Chaz jams for about $257, which is like 80 bigs. So when it comes around to me and I'm looking at my pocket eights, I'm ahead. Okay, unless they have a bigger pair, I'm ahead. I'm a little frustrated at this point. So I just figured that I might as well get it in because if I can get it in and get two callers and I am correct with they, them having big aces, I'm probably ahead. Their aces are gonna negate, negate themselves and I could get a triple up. Chaz just has a seven, so Paul just has to hold. Clean flop, no problem. Clean turn, no problem. And of course, with an ace dead, because there's an ace in Poker Traveler's hand, Chaz hits his two outer on the river and now Paul is stuck a third buy-in and you're just like so sick to your stomach. Basically got felted for the third time for the night, but I wouldn't play that hand any differently. You know, eights are ahead of ace, king, ace, queen. You know, so I'll take eights every day against your ace, king, and ace, queen. Um, so we could flip that a million times and I'm gonna come out ahead. Maybe not a lot, but I'm still gonna come out ahead. Uh, numbers are numbers. For me, I'd been very uh, careful in cherry picking my spots again because of the aggression on my left. We were kind of nickel and diamond our way up, but the key hand that kind of sealed a win for us Poker Traveler opened to $15 from early position, and there were three callers by the time it got to me. So I'm in the small blind. I look down at Queen Jack off, and it's one of those situations where it's probably not really a squeeze hand from a theory perspective. You probably just call and see if you can hit the flop. But from kind of an exploit perspective, when there's that many callers, we really only have to get through Poker Traveler. And he'd been playing pretty tight. We'd just seen him fold Ace Queen to a squeeze earlier. Uh, so I felt pretty good that maybe I could get through him. And if I could get through him, there's so much dead money in the pot, I can just pick up a hundred bucks right here. So I went really big. I squeezed to $105. Poker Traveler makes a call. Everybody else folds. So now there's $200 in the pot and I'm out of position on Poker Traveler with a mediocre hand with queen jack offsuit. Flop comes king three, two dry. I have the range advantage here. It's a three bet pot. I know I have to bet. I go small, perfectly fine. It's a very dry static board for the circumstances in the situation. He calls, not good. The turn is a queen, probably the best card in the deck for us. Um, at this point we have showdown value, we have options. I can lead uh, a second barrel. Um, I can check and call. Um, I elected to check call. I felt like while betting definitely continues to tell the story and we do still have range advantage here, I felt like it was a little overvaluing what our particular hand wanted to do. It also kept the pot more manageable. I wanted to keep the pot at a size where I could call some bluffs on river um, should I get to that point. Uh, so I checked and interestingly enough, Poker Traveler checked behind. So at this point, pretty confident we have the best hand. Um, debating between what I want to do on the river and the river ends up being another king. And this is a really, actually really, really good card for us because it makes it pretty much impossible for him to have any king X. Um, we don't have a ton of King X here, but we can definitely have some King X that slows down and doesn't want to go for three streets. Um, but this is also a card that our opponents can look at and say, well, it's really hard for opponents to have a King. So this was a fist pump value bet spot for me. I decided to flick in a black chip. 
Poker Traveler makes a pretty quick call, flips over pocket nines, and we end up winning a nice pot that kind of set us up for the night with a couple hundred dollars of profit. So the one hand of the night um, was really interesting. It was uh, myself against Rob. I raise eights from middle position. He three bets me. We've had some three bet battles before. I'm used to this. I look down at king queen. I three bet my king queen. And then Rob called. And then flop was two jack four. And I check intending to call and he just checks. Rob checked and I checked back. And now by checking back, okay, it would normally make to most people that I do not have a jack. Doesn't necessarily keep him completely capped or uh, anything like that. The turn is also a brick. And at this point, I have to bet. I need to protect my hand and deny him equity with his over cards and also just kind of force him to make a decision. So I bet $40 and he raises me to 100. You know, when you get to the level that we're playing at poker, it's more of a leveling war a lot of the time. The only hands that really picked up equity on the turn were pocket fives, ace x that picks up a gut shot, and that's it. Like he, he just doesn't have any hands that like don't have equity on flop, pick up equity on turn, and now he wants to turn them into a bluff in case he doesn't get there on river. So it's a really weird spot. So I was pretty confident he had a, he had me beat. He had a, probably a middle pair somewhere in there, and I just had to get him to fold because there's no bluffs here. So he can't go, okay, well, he's bluffing. So I'm kind of doing a reverse thought process of how he's thinking. And so he knows it's a spot where he doesn't have any bluffs. So he decides to bluff knowing that he doesn't have any bluffs and knowing that I know that he shouldn't have any bluffs, hoping that he can convince me it's value. And I just completely fell for it and took the bait. That's what you want people to think. Um, and then you come in with a raise on the turn. Hopefully they don't know exactly where you're at. And that's exactly what happened in that hand. I got a little revenge. So now it's Tuesday. We get to head to Dallas for this live stream at TCH Dallas. This is where I played my first ever live stream last year. And obviously it was an opportunity for me to uh, right some wrongs from my past stream. I kind of went back after the live stream and I kind of looked at it, evaluated my last four or five sessions of poker. Um, went through my study materials that I've been studying, and it was very, very evident that I was changing my game in a way that I was leaning towards worrying about bankroll and not worrying about playing the hands the way I normally would play them. So I went into the stream last night. I didn't know anyone. I didn't know anybody that was in the stream. Um, so they didn't know me, so I was just gonna play my, my game. I was gonna be as aggressive as I normally am. Um, I wasn't gonna mess around. I was gonna to try to pick spots that I think I could get away with some bluffs and things like that. I just came in determined to just have a great stream and be a great presence and not worry about the money and stress about the money. The money was gonna be whatever it is. Let's go out and have fun and make sure everybody else has a good time and gives them some action. So right out of the gate, first hand, I open Jack eight suited, I get a collar and uh, DFS brat who I've know and am friends with and have played poker with before, uh, puts in a three bet. I'm not going anywhere. I told you I was here. I make the call. We go to uh, flop. The flop comes a seven, six rainbow. And it's not the best flop for me, obviously. It's a really good flop for him, but he actually bet really small on flop. He bet like 33%. And while uh, this, that's a perfectly fine sizing, there was something about the way he made his bet that I thought, uh, he didn't feel confident. It didn't mean he didn't have a hand, but I felt like I thought maybe I could get to him. So with backdoor flush and straight draws, I'm like, let's just get this action kicked off early. So I put in a check raise. He kind of tanks for a bit and calls, turns a seven that brings a flush draw in. It's not a good card for us from a theory perspective, but I'm like, sometimes players don't realize what good cards or bad cards are. And I'm like, I could defend like some suited connectors that would get spicy on flop with back doors and turn trips. So I continue the story. I figure I'm either gonna get this bluff through and it's gonna be sick, or uh, I'm gonna get called and uh, I'm gonna have a really good image for the rest of the night. He tanks for a while. At one point, it looks like he's gonna fold. I'm like, man, I'm gonna get this through. This is gonna look so sick on stream. And then he goes all in. <laughs> so we 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 uh, we punt about two hundred and twenty dollars right out of the gate, and uh, it is what it is. And and from that point in the night, we just had to start digging and digging and digging. 
So Paul spends the first couple orbits playing really tight and kind of building that old man coffee image. And then while he's talking to the table about the project and the Tesla and something he's doing, he picks up aces. And it's really cool if you watch the video, he picks up aces and he carries on a conversation like nothing's happening. And I think that really helped uh, helped him in this particular hand because it looked like there was nothing special about this hand. It looked like he wasn't really paying attention to it. So the one hand, I finally get a pair of aces. So I raise. He three bets. I look down, I have the aces. Um, we only have $500 stacks. And Paul immediately four bets to $150. And at this point, I'm thinking, okay, this looks like the goods. D-Man makes the call and the flop comes uh, 10 high with two diamonds. And they immediately get it in. And oh, oh my gosh, does this situation look familiar? Paul has aces. D-Man has a suited king. On the turn, a king comes. So now he has more out. So now it's just, oh my God, I've been running bad for two weeks. How long can this possibly continue? And then I believe a 10 of spades came on the river and saved me. So I got a, a full double up, which felt good. Um, obviously it's just a cooler hand. There's nothing how that would have gotten in any different. Um, so he did nothing wrong. I just was on the lucky end of having aces to his king queen suited. Um, but there's always a sweat. It couldn't have just flopped like two, seven, five, three, eight, you know, uh, but that was that hand. Meanwhile, for me, I tried to keep my foot on the pedal and just keep hammering. And it was like the night of aces. I, uh, defended a three bet with king queen run into aces, flop top pair. I actually managed to get away from it on the flop because uh, Chesapeake bet over pot on the flop and I made a tight fold. And then not that much later, I pick up jacks over an open on a call. I squeeze to $75. And what does Chesapeake have again? You guessed it, aces. Rips it in for $450. I again make a tight fold. He shows aces. So we're just shredding money at this point. I'm down almost four to $500 within the first hour of this game. And now I just have to go to work. Fortunately for me, I started picking up hands. There was a situation where there was a raise, multiple callers. I was in the blinds and called off with my king, queen of hearts. Flop came 10, nine, nine, two diamonds. It checked around. Uh, surprisingly enough, we got to see a turn and the turn was a Jack of Diamonds. Good card, not great card, good card. Uh, obviously having a straight is huge, but with three diamonds on the board, we are very vulnerable at this spot. And um, it's a little bit tricky to play on river and we could just be drawing debt. We could be running into some full houses. We could be running into some flushes. Um, so it checks to Jason who bets $20 and we put in a very small check raise of $55. I think we're supposed to go bigger here just because of how wet the board is, but I didn't really feel like his bet was very strong. It felt kind of showdowny. It felt kind of blocker bettish, and I didn't want to lose him. So I took a risk. I undersized my three bet to $55 and he did make the call. The river, I'm like, just please don't be a diamond. It bricks out, it's a four. We go for about a $95 value bet on the river. He tanked forever before he finally showed ace jack and we did not get the river value from him. Going into the World Series, uh, we're gonna be leaving in a couple weeks. Um, still gonna build some bankroll here in San Antonio, play some tournaments, um, just get, get a feel for everything and then head out to Vegas probably at the end, you know, first of June uh, timeframe. Uh, looking forward to going. Um, not 100% sure how it's gonna look when we get out there. Um, I have an opportunity to deal the World Series of Poker. Um, so I might do that. Uh, have an opportunity to kind of do something I've always wanted to do, which was deal the World Series, because it is a, a one-time bucket list that I'd like to do. Um, they are offering possible part-time positions to deal for a couple of days because they're shorthanded on dealers due to COVID from last year. And they have a feeling that the series is gonna be super big this year. So we'll see when we get out there, but the, the plan is to still go out there and do our best we can. But I can definitely tell you, for all the people that are supporting me and backing me, there is no more taking our foot off the gas pedal. And so here I am on a Wednesday night, I'm recording the last video that I'm gonna do here from San Antonio 
uh, looking back over the last three weeks, this trip has been a huge success in terms of the things that I wanted to largely accomplish. Um, I came out here to see if I could beat the cash games. I was able to do that, so I feel really good about that. I came out here to learn more about this content experience and get better at content, and I've learned a ton out here. Uh, and I feel like I have really gotten myself in a good place poker foundationally heading into the World Series. Did I build as much bankroll as I wanted to? No, we still have bankroll issues. It's still going to be a uh, interesting few weeks leading up to the series. But as I drive home tomorrow, I have no complaints about how this trip went. And this what he said, you gotta get paid. Do what you gotta do, get to the bag. Stay at your nine if I get on the avenue. You ain't cut out for them bags. Yeah, you are not good enough. You are the type of got people they shouldn't love. Anyone knowing you know that you phony. You never cut out for this. You should just give it up. Yeah, but that's how they want me to feel. I am the man of the steel, king of the hill, man of the year. Finally feel like I got it for real. Yeah, but all of them voices, we got them. Lie to me, Hillary Rodham. I just came back from my kid in the bottom. And now I'm gonna bring it back all the way on. Yeah. Time.